It is our purpose, indeed it is our responsibility. Anytime there is a baptism, uh, first to ensure that the one being baptized knows what they're doing. It's very important. It's not something to be entered in lightly or ignorantly. So we endeavor to do that carefully and anyone who requests baptism must come and speak to us and we go through some matters concerning that subject. And then we also have a responsibility to remind the congregation about what baptism is all about in some regard as well. So we'll seek to do that tonight. Um, perhaps some of it might be very enlightening for some, who knows, as we deal with some of these topics. We're going to be looking at Christian baptism, not really in the narrative of this time. Last time we dealt with Acts chapter 8, this time it will be a little more topical. But we're going to read from chapter 28 of Matthew and verse 9. Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All heal. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And amen indeed. Would you bow your head and your heart with me, please, around the throne of grace as we just once again pray for the Lord's help as we seek to expound the Word of God to you. Lord, we thank Thee for the gospel that allows us to sing such tremendous poetry that is straight out of Thy Word. To know my sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Surely we all cry, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. We pray tonight that thou wilt continue to be with us and encourage us, and let the word of God be appropriate to every heart. As we seek to deal with this subject, we pray that thou wilt make it a means of edification, building up to the saints of God, and that those who may be without Christ may realize they know little or nothing about the Savior. We pray that their interest may be piqued and they might have a desire to come to know Him, whom to know is life eternal. We ask for Thy help and Thy favor. We pray for the Holy Ghost to come upon us. And we pray, Lord, that Christ will be preeminent and glorified in everything said and done. Hear us and be with us. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. I've read this passage with you at the end of Matthew's Gospel just to remind you of the Great Commission, as it is known, that was given to the apostles by the Lord Jesus Christ. A commission that included not only <coughs> the preaching of the Gospel, but to those who would receive the Gospel, that they should also be, as we know it, baptized. And you see it there, <coughs> excuse me, uh, go ye therefore, in verse 19, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And that's what's going to take place tonight. Ever since the Lord Jesus instituted this, commanded this, ordained this, gave this issue to his church and said, this is your mission, we have been doing it ever since. Taking people and upon profession of faith, baptizing them, and in some cases, in some quarters, their children as well. We have assembled again this time for this evening's service and have the privilege of being reminded 
of the importance of Christian baptism. And make no mistake, men and women, baptism is an important thing. It's important that we understand its value and the fact that God has given it to us, not just for some kind of show, not for just, well, let's just do something so that they, they know they're Christian, but he has given it very purposefully to uh, signify certain truths and indeed even to seal to our hearts those truths that we have already received if we are Christian. Baptism is an outward visible sign that God has given to signify what is promised to the sinner who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's visible. The language of the gospel is full of promises. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come and take of me. The Lord Jesus is always telling us to come and drink of him. He is always inviting us to come to him. He is encouraging sinners to embrace him. Always, over and over again, Jesus Christ is never turning men away who truly have a humble heart and desire to know him. And that's encouraging. It's encouraging for me that as I stand before you, and if there's anyone here tonight who wants to know Christ, I know I can issue the invitation that Christ himself issues to you to come to him, to come to know him personally. But it's also encouraging for those who, of us who have already received him. To be reminded of the fact that this uh, experience of the gospel is something that the Lord wants us to fully embrace and know and has given us this visible sign to help our senses. It's talked about in our catechism as sensible signs, referring to the fact that they, they appeal to our senses and we can feel it and experience it and it kind of ratifies in our hearts to some degree what God has already done in our lives. It is an object lesson that Christ has appointed to, de to depict a vital and glorious message. And often in baptism, the focus is placed upon the individual and their commitment. And there is a measure of that involved. And we will be seeing that tonight as Brett will come forward and he will uh, very publicly uh, make a profession of faith and what he believes and what the Lord Jesus Christ means to him and so on. But while that's involved, what we are really observing in baptism is the Lord's declaration that he saves sinners through union with his son, Jesus Christ. It is not all about Brett and his promise to God. It is more about God's promise to Brett, that he has received him, that he will accept him upon the ground of Jesus Christ, his merit, his life, death, and resurrection. Brett has a promise that he is right before God. And God has given this sign to encourage him, as is the case for us all who receive him, that this indeed is something he is willing to keep. It is a sign of a promise that has more to do with God than man. And just as God gave the sign to Noah, the sign in the sky, that which we know as the rainbow, and he put it there to remind Noah and all his posterity he will never again destroy the earth with water. That will never again happen, never has happened. And God is true to his word. And every time I see a rainbow, I cannot but remember that fact. God has promised. God has promised. And historically, through all the millennia that has passed since Noah's day, God has been true to his word. He has not destroyed the world entirely with water, as was the case there in Noah's day. He has kept his word. And so I see that sign and I say, God is true to his word. That sign reminds me that God is faithful. So it is with other signs that God gives, such as the sign of circumcision to Abraham. It was a sign that God gave of what he would do, that he would uh, change hearts of those who trust him, believe him, receive him by faith. And so is baptism. It is reminding all of us here tonight who are believers that God keeps his word. If a sinner comes to Christ, they will be washed, they will be cleansed, they will be placed into union with the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So as we consider tonight this topic of Christian baptism, I want you to have your Bible in hand. We will be going to various places and looking at various texts, and I want you to follow with us as we try to open up at least some aspect. I mean, this is a huge subject, massive, and that barely begins to scratch the surface of how long you could go on dealing with this topic. But we want to give some idea, some interesting, we trust, uh, truths concerning this subject. The first thing as we consider Christian baptism is a problematic motive for baptism. 
Now, there is this problematic motive sometimes in some quarters, and we want to understand that before we go anywhere else. We want to begin with the negative, if you like, before we go to the positive. We must always remember that there's a distinction between God's work in the heart and the ordinance of baptism, that there is a distinction. They are not uh, together. They're not united together. It is not by baptism that God will change the heart of Brett. Brett's heart's already changed. Those who receive Christ instantaneously are changed. We are complete in Him, as we sang at the very opening hymn. One uh, truth that's absolutely essential to get is this fact that baptism merely signifies the truth. It doesn't confer the truth that we are saved by Jesus Christ. And I must underline that because there are many groups of various types. Uh, some are Roman Catholic, and some are in Anglican quarters, and some are in uh, certain Protestant quarters, and even Baptistic quarters as well, um, that, that believe that baptism is part of salvation, that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. And that's what I'm saying to you. I must begin with a negative in this regard to make sure no one here is under such a delusion. It's very easy to think, well, I was baptized, maybe in adulthood, maybe even as a child, and I have no problem with that. In fact, I believe in that myself, but I, I, we, we, there's a danger in coming to a conclusion that the water applied to the subject saves. It does not. And the Scripture makes that abundantly clear, and I need to make that clear to you tonight. I'll give, firstly, scriptural statements which refute this idea. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll see the Apostle Paul, I think, by implication, making it very clear that baptism itself cannot ever save. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Here we'll, he's dealing with the division in the church at Corinth. And he talks about the, this various aspect of being divided and the lack of unity. But he makes an interesting statement in, in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. So if we are to understand that baptism can save, that there's some saving value in baptism, how could we ever understand this text to say anything but the fact that Paul is saying, I thank God that I saw none of you saved except these two men. I mean, it makes no sense. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. He's talking to all the believers in that city, a huge big city that he went into, and he spent 18 months in, and he's there, and he's communicating the gospel to them. And he's saying, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, or Gaius, depending what way you want to pronounce it. And he's basically saying, therefore, that I wasn't involved in baptizing. I wasn't interested even in baptizing. There were a couple I baptized, but my primary goal was to preach the gospel. Now, if the gospel itself does not save, merely declared, does not save when it's received by the hearer, we must say, well, Paul, you failed miserably in your mission to go and preach the gospel and effectually bring men to Christ. Because if they need to be baptized, you ought to have baptized them. But he didn't. I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So he's saying, if we believe in baptismal regeneration as it's known, then it's essentially saying to us, Paul is like, well, I'm glad that I didn't see any of you saved except these two men. Why would he be glad about such a thing? It doesn't make any sense at all. If you go down to verse 17 of the same chapter, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And again, he's, he's showing here that his ministry was more essential to bringing men to Christ and reconciling them to God that he was involved in the declaration of the message. And he says, Christ sent me not to baptize. I wasn't sent with that predominant ministry. And I'm not even concerned about baptizing individuals. It's not that I'm diminishing baptism. It's not that I'm saying it's not important. I'm just making it clear that my primary goal is to preach the cross and bring men to Christ, to see them saved. And they will be saved whether baptized or not. I believe, therefore, this passage makes it abundantly clear 
that baptismal regeneration is a, is a lie, it's a flaw, it's not something that we ought to believe. The reason that we are saved is because of the Spirit's work, not the work of water. And further on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, I'll read a verse there. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. By the Spirit, therefore, we are baptized into body. What body? The body of Christ. The unity of all believers, all together, universally all gathered together as one body. How were we brought into that body? By water? No, by the Spirit. By the Spirit that strove in our hearts when we heard the gospel and received it. We are saved, therefore, without baptism, regardless of baptism. And these scriptural statements make that plain. But also scriptural scenarios refute this as well. There are a couple of scenarios or narratives that I believe make very clear that baptism has no salvific value. We have firstly the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23. Very familiar scene, I'm sure, to many even here tonight. Luke chapter 23 and in verse 39, we're at Calvary on Golgotha's Mount and it tells us in Luke 23, 39, one of the malefactors which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, the other malefactor on the other side, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, hath done nothing, am nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, you need to be baptized. No. He said, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today. You're hanging on the cross. You're being crucified. You're going to die in a matter of moments, essentially. There's no opportunity for baptism. But be assured, I will receive you. You will be in eternity with me. So that's the positive one who went to heaven without baptism, but we also have one who was baptized and perhaps didn't go to heaven at all. This is in Simon, the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8, and we are told about him, and Philip goes down to Samaria. Tremendous things are done. God is saving many souls, but there's always chaff among the wheat, and so it was to be the case even in these days during the first century and the apostles and men like Philip. And so in Acts chapter 8 and verse 13, We've been told a little bit about this man Simon and his great influence, his uh, sorcery and so on. And then verse 13 it says, Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon believes, he's baptized, and he is showing forth some measure of fruit of faith in Jesus Christ. And yet if you go on down to verse 19, he sees the miracles of that are happening and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon people by the laying on of hands. And verse 19 says, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. So and he is, he is willing to offer money. If you look at verse 18 as well, he wants to buy it. He wants to have this capability. And so verse 20, Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You read this language and it seems certainly at this point that Simon's not saved. He was baptized, but he wasn't saved. Baptism didn't save him. It didn't change his heart. Thy heart is not right before God. In the sight of God, you're, you're still unregenerate, Simon. So I wanted to get that out of the way, this, this uh, uh, problematic motive for baptism, that someone may come and say to themselves, well, I want to be baptized because I want to go to heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. It's not just throw a little water on you as an infant or even as an adult, uh, and then along you go and do what you want. That, that doesn't work that way. There has to be a change of heart. There has to be a work of the Spirit. There has to be a transformation. And that is what we're always looking for. I mean, when people come to us and say, I want to be baptized, we don't just go, sure, come ahead. We've been watching them. We've been observing them. If I had doubts about the person's life and question marks over them about whether they truly knew the Lord, then I wouldn't go ahead with it. I wouldn't do it. I would tell them, why? I've got concerns. 
But whenever I see a change of heart, evidence of grace, a manifestation of the work of God in the heart, as best as I can judge, I say, Amen. Be baptized. Let's go ahead and baptize you. But that's because you're already saved, not because the baptism itself will save. Secondly, the primary meaning of baptism. The primary meaning of baptism. We've seen a bad motive to be baptized. I want to get to the positive now and consider the primary meaning of what baptism is all about. What does it mean when we say to be baptized or baptism? What does it mean? And again, it would be interesting. Sometimes I say these things and I begin to wonder we should just stop and just get some questions or get some feedback as to what people believe baptism is all about. Because there's a lot of different ideas about baptism, even within the Christian church. And some aren't particularly helpful and some miss the mark completely. They don't get what baptism is about at all. And some will tell you that every time you read the word baptize or baptism, you can replace it with the word immerse or immersion, and that's how you understand it. It means immerse, immersion, and every time you read that, you just put that in and that's what it means. Well, that wouldn't exactly be true. And our standards, the standards of this church, we're Presbyterian. That means we go by the Westminster Confession of Faith, if that means anything to some who are here tonight. But it means we have a certain confession, a certain standard that has been put in the 1640s, put together, and to this day still is second to none in articulating Christian doctrine. And in the catechism that they put together, the Shorter Catechism, it asks this question, what is baptism? And it says, baptism is a sacrament wherein the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost doth signify and seal our engrafting into Christ and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. Now, I don't want to open up all the different statements. It's pithy. There's a lot in there, and we could preach on that for a number of weeks. But it's this idea of being, as, being a, a signifying and sealing or engrafting into Christ. The language of engrafting into Christ is language of union. And that's the point. When you see the word baptism, or you come across baptized or whatever, essentially, the word signifies union with Christ, or it signifies union in general. But certainly when it comes to Christian baptism, it's union with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just some, oh, but that means immerse. Well, you know, it may be, that might be the action that takes place, as will be the case tonight. But there's more meaning there. There's more depth to that meaning. And I want to show you that as we go on in this. We are brought into union with Christ. And I think this is wonderfully brought out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to flip over there, you might be surprised at the language the Apostle Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that's the presence of God in the wilderness, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so on, he goes on and talks about their experience in the wilderness, the, the children of Israel. Well, there was this cloud that led them to the Red Sea, and then led them through the Red Sea. But do you see the language that's used? They were baptized onto or into, same preposition, Moses. Moses. Now, why on earth would the children of Israel be baptized into or onto Moses? I mean, what, what sense is that? But the idea is that of union. If you see this merely as immerse, that the children of Israel were immersed into Moses, and you think of that being water, well, you think about the Red Sea. What happened to water in the Red Sea? It parted. And it formed walls up the side. And the ground that they traveled on was as dry as could be. And there was no immersing, and there was no pouring, and there was no sprinkling. It doesn't tell me there was any spray coming over and getting them. Nothing. They were baptized, it says, into Moses. And the idea is, men and women, and believers here particularly tonight, is to show that the children of Israel were in union with Moses. Moses was representing them. They were at one with him. They were following him. He was leading the way as a mediator before God on their behalf. And they were in him, in union with him. And that is why the Apostle Paul can use the word baptize. They were in union with Moses. In Romans chapter 6, 
This is a very well known and well used passage when it comes to baptisms. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. It talks here about being baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. But like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, if you've ever been to a baptism before, particularly one where an adult's being immersed, this is often the text that we'll be drawn to. And I've no problem with that, by the way. It does have application. But <laughs> there's no water here. There's no water in Romans chapter 6. The Apostle Paul's not thinking about water. There's no, there's, no part of, there's no part that water has to play in his mind at all. In fact, if we put water into Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, if we say there's water there, the only way it can be understood is to believe what we said we can't believe in our first point, that we are saved by baptism. Because look at it. What does it say? Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ. So there we are, we think about water, baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should uh, also should walk in newness of life. What's it talking about? It's talking about new life in Christ. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about what happens when someone is saved. Now if we put water in there, we're saying what's necessary is to be baptized by water, immersed by water, in order to experience newness of life. And that's baptismal regeneration. That's saying that we need water to be saved. And I hope none of us believe that. We've already tried to make sure that we don't. Now, it does have application. I'm not denying that. In that once I have been spiritually, because that's the sense of it, when Brett, when I, when you who are saved here tonight came to Jesus Christ, put your trust in Christ, you just rested in Him for salvation entirely, completely, fully, without any addition, not your own works, nor any church sacrament, but you rested in Christ completely and totally. At that point, in a moment, an act of the Spirit, this happened. You were baptized into Jesus Christ. You were put in union. That's the sense. That's the meaning of the word. You came into union with Jesus Christ and were baptized that is in union with his death. So therefore, you were buried with him by baptism into death. It's all spiritual, signifying what happens in the heart of an individual who comes to know Jesus Christ. Now, when you came to Christ, you didn't know this was going on, but spiritually, this was what was happening. This is what the Lord was doing without water, completely dry. The Lord did this in your heart. So what we're saying to you is baptism means union. It means union. And that might not mean a whole lot to some of you who don't come here. But I'm always emphasizing that idea, that doctrine, that teaching to the people who assemble here week after week. Because let me tell you, if you never come here again, Understanding your union with Jesus Christ is one of the most important doctrines you need to get as a Christian. If you don't get that you're in union with Jesus Christ, you'll always be struggling with assurance. And you'll never really know. And you'll be up and down and you'll be doubting all the time. You'll be struggling to really see, how could God save me? How could God forgive me? I know I was saved, but I've done this. How can I be assured that I'm still saved? Listen, if you understand, and I can't take time to get into that aspect now, but if you understand that you're in union with Christ, that when God the Father sees you, He sees His Son. He sees the perfections of His Son. He doesn't see your sin. Your sin is under the blood. You're in union with Jesus Christ. You're loved, as John puts it in 1 John, loved as Christ is loved, equally so. That's the glory of union with Christ. 
that there is no greater love that the Father can actually show to you. His love toward His Son is reciprocated then in you as well because you are seen as in union with Him. That's why the Bible everywhere talks in terms of Him being the head and we being the body. What kind of organic creature can have any kind of meaning decapitated? Where God the Father can love the head but not love the body, or love the head more than he loves the body. Look, you're in so in union with Christ. The Father loves God, loves you, and he couldn't love you more. Why? Because you're a good little boy? No, no. Because you're in union with Christ. That moment you put your trust in Christ, you came into union with the perfect, spotless, Lamb of God. And that is why Paul can declare, and this is just one of his declarations, but everywhere he is talking about this idea, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. None. Romans 8 verse 1. There's no condemnation. No exceptions. Understanding this then is critical. Because as Brett Brett is baptized tonight, it is signifying this. He is in union with Christ. And you may know him well. You may know him better than I do. And you might be able to see fault in him. Surely his wife would be able to, as is the case for us all. But he is in union with Christ. And one of the saddest things is when a church and with God's people, genuine People who love the Lord Jesus Christ in truth are always tearing one another apart. And even within the body, they make each other the object of gossip. Because they're viewing one another purely on the external. They're not viewing one another as Christ views them in union with himself. I don't see anywhere where Jesus Christ is going to have regrets for those that he has saved. None. None at all. Now unto him, Jude 24 says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. At times we put up with one another, don't we? We put up with one another. And we put up with people in our church. <laughs> and we don't maybe get gel or get on or we maybe grit and we go through periods where we, we maybe upset one another. And we view each other through that lens. And the wonderful thing is, see on that day, <laughs> all, that was in sub, all, was, all that was a matter for gossip for you, it's not in the mind of Christ. It's not there. He is going to welcome you in with exceeding joy. You think about that. Think about that if you're here and you feel yourself as a failed Christian. You think about that. You say, I can't serve God. You don't know what I have done. I have ruined my testimony. I have no power before my family. They know what I have done. Others know what I have done. And you get discouraged and you feel yourself to be incapacitated by a sense of guilt of the past. This is what I'm saying to you. If you don't understand your union with Christ, that will end you. Did it end David? A man who committed adultery and then tried to hide his sin. And then in order to hide that sin, he actually ordered the death of that woman's husband, Uriah. So he's guilty of adultery and murder. Did David think, I'm cut off. There's no hope for me. There's no chance. I can't do anything for God anymore. No, you read Psalm 51. You see, you see, you understand David knew that the standing before God was always in his Messiah, in his deliverer, in the one he was looking to. And so he could say, just restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I can't change the past. Lord, if you restore unto me the joy of my salvation, if I get a full 
sense of the joy of what I have in my God. Then says, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will be converted unto thee. David didn't think he was going to be set on the shelf and useless for God. No. Even though he committed adultery and murder, a man after God's own heart, but he understood his union with Christ. And that's what baptism's about. When I see a baptism, I think, here is one in union with Christ. There was I when I went and I was baptized. I'm in union with Christ. And when I went through those waters, and I went under that water, I'm thinking, applying it personally now, having looked back over 13 years since I was baptized, I didn't know what the future held. I had no idea what was on the morrow. But I can now say what God signified in my baptism, that I am in union with Christ, and because I'm in union with Him, he will never leave me nor forsake me. He will never shut me off. I will always be forever His. <laughs> in 13 years, I can say, well, it's true. Because here I am, and I still love Him. And I'm still serving Him. And I thank God for what He has done. And so it is for you here tonight. As you see the baptism, you remember your own. And you remember your in union with Christ. That's what baptism essentially is. Your in union so he will keep you from falling to the point he will present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, this is the primary meaning of baptism, men and women. It is the primary meaning. It has other aspects to it, but this is essentially it. God is promising those who receive Christ are in union with him. They will never be cut off, ever. Thirdly, finally, the possible modes for baptism. The possible modes for baptism. This can sometimes be a little bit heated. How should a person be baptized anyway? We, again, as I said, Presbyterian, so in our Confession of Faith, it says in chapter 28, paragraph 3, dipping of the person into the water is not necessary, but baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. And what it's saying is essentially that it's open. It's open. It doesn't have to be immersion. It can be sprinkling. It can be pouring. And according to the brilliant minds who are behind this confession, all three modes are acceptable. They take an inclusive position, allowing all, whereas many churches take an exclusive position. And they say, unless you're baptized by a certain form, and normally, I don't know of any other exceptions, but... In nearly all cases, it is exclusive with regard to immersion. If you're not immersed, you're not baptized. But are they right? They have the right to their opinion. And I wouldn't fight over it. Although if they were quest to question me, I would certainly put my opinion across. But scripturally, are they right? Is it right to have this exclusive view? I am quite willing, and indeed I would encourage anyone who comes as an adult to be baptized to be immersed. And the reason I do that is not because I think immersion is better, but because there may come a day where they leave my fellowship away from my ministry, jobs take them somewhere else or something else changes, and they have to go somewhere, and the best church near them is some church that requires immersion in order to be a member. So in order to save the ridiculous scenario of being baptized twice, just be immersed now and then be done with it. So that's why I encourage it. It's looking over the weaker brethren and, and looking at it down the line, doing it the safe way so they don't have that silly experience to go through. But is it right to exclude other forms? Before we look at the Scriptures, history would suggest no. A first century document, I think around AD 70, they reckon it was written, the Didache means the teaching, um, makes it clear that around that apostolic era, immersion was not necessary, that other forms of baptism, uh, modes of baptism were experienced and were performed, as well as the church fathers also make that clear. And when we come to the word baptize, 
As we've already said, it really means union, and it's not exclusively in Scripture used to mean immerse. It's not. It just isn't, as we've seen already in various Scriptures. And there's a lot I could deal with. I don't want to take too much time in going through all this, but I'll just point out a few things for you, just for your own benefit, so you know. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. See, if we, could, if we could read Greek, then I would have an easier job, and you wouldn't have to question. You would see this for yourself. But in Hebrews chapter 9, and the Apostle Paul, as I believe it is the writer here, he is dealing with matters concerning the temple and their cleansing and so on. In chapter 9, verses, uh, we'll read from verse 7 for context. He says, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Talking about the atonement. The day of atonement. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as uh, the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So they couldn't perfect him. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings, different washings, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation, until the time when Christ would come. But the point is this, I'm not getting into mining out the meaning of the text, but in verse 10, I don't know what translation you've got. We use the authorized version here. It's divers washings. It means different washings. But the word washings means baptism. It is baptism. It doesn't mean it. It is baptism. If you're reading it in the Greek, it would tell you different baptisms. But this is in the temple. It's not baptizing. It's, it's, it's just... It, it, and with regard to all that furniture that was washed and made ceremonially clean, some of it was far too big to ever immerse. There's no possible way it was immersed. So they had to have been washed in a different way. If you go to Mark chapter 7, this becomes even more clear. Mark chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. I'll just be quick with this. Mark 7, verse 3. The Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not. So this is the, the, the fact they had to come and wash themselves before they came to eat, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come... From the market, except they wash, they eat not. Many other things there be which they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Now, the word there, washing of cups, is baptize. Baptizing cups. Well, you could immerse a cup. That would be okay. You could even immerse some pots as well. And the brazen vessel, well, some of those would be problematic. And the tables, they would be impossible. The tables were far too large. In fact, it may even mean couch or bed. They're not too sure exactly how to translate this word. But the idea is it's a big piece of furniture, which in the tabernacle and the temple, they couldn't have immersed. They couldn't have put completely underwater. And yet the Holy Spirit is using the term baptize. So there must have been a different way of baptizing them without immersing them. And there was. They would pour and they would wash them in a way that was practical because it was all ceremonial anyway. Basically, immersion, pouring, sprinkling, all signifies different things and is all legitimate. And if you were sprinkled, that's okay. I know there's some here tonight, and they were sprinkled. And if you were poured, that's okay, that's fine. And if you were immersed, that's fine, I was. And they all signify different things. When you're immersed, it's signifying burial and resurrection, according to Romans 6. When you're poured, it signifies a life in the Spirit. I could bring that out, of course, and go back and show you how the, John the Baptist says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Remember that prophecy John said about Jesus? He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So when we come and see when the church is baptized with the Holy Ghost, what's the word that's used? Poured. Okay. Yeah, poured, not immersed. They were poured. And so pouring signifies a certain truth there that's important. And the same with sprinkling. All through the Old Testament, even in the book of Hebrews, we see that sprinkling has a cleansing effect. It, it speaks of ceremonial cleansing. So even that is legitimate. I just bring that to you to make one simple point. If someone is baptized by a different mode, don't think less of them. Don't believe all the nonsense that immersion is the only way. I, I really feel that that is not an honest look at Scripture. 
personally, and if you believe differently, that's okay. But I'm presenting to this congregation an understanding so we have an open, loving, accepting view of people who have different views. Baptism has been a means of division down through the years. It has, and it ought not to be, because this is a glorious thing that's happening tonight. It's glorious. It's not to, meant to be. Think of it. Think of it. That Jesus institutes right there we read back in Matthew 28. Go and baptize the nations. And instead we're fighting over the way to do it and who to do it with and so on and getting all caught up in that. It has its place. It's, it, it has. But there is too much emphasis on fighting over minute details when we should rejoice that someone Christ has saved and wants to be baptized. And we're going to rejoice in that tonight. I am. And I hope you join with me because it's great. It's so great to see someone God has saved. If one soul meet me at God's right hand, my heaven will be two heavens in Emmanuel's land. And to see people come to Christ, and Brett was saved not through me, but just to, to see people saved and then sanctified and growing, is just a wonderful thing. To see brands plucked from the burning. To see people on the way to hell delivered from the wrath to come. To see lives transformed and with a heart to live for the glory of God. It's glorious. And if you don't see that or understand that, it's because you're not out really dealing with all the sins that are in this world. When you see someone transformed and put on a new path, it's wonderful. You see the work of God's grace in their life. So, as Brett will come forward and he will be baptized, it is a mark of God's grace in his life. It depicts a desire he has to obey the Lord and that desire the Lord has given to him for which we thank the Lord. And so, all here who have been baptized, we will look at this and see the union with Christ, the need for cleansing, and the covenant that God has made to accept sinners who believe. God has been so good to all of us who are saved. Let us rejoice with Brett, with Sharon, with his friends and family who may be here, that God has done this work for him. And we trust that the Lord will help you to rejoice in your baptism as well. And if you're not baptized, and you're not baptized because you're not saved, I trust you will pay attention to what is going on tonight and ask yourself what you're doing with your life, and more importantly, what you're doing with eternity. That you're gambling with the eternity that is to come, uncertain about what will occur tomorrow, and playing games. You need to be right with God. And if at the end of this service you would like to talk to me about these matters, then please come and talk to us about them. Let's just bow before the Lord briefly in prayer. Just